Well, I'll call the meeting to order. Kia ora tato. I think the first business that we have this morning is the submission of Stix Living Laboratory Trust. Is there a representative there? Yes. Bethany Baker, who's just stepping up now. Thank you. Ms Baker, is it? Yes, it is. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and thank you for your submission. Oh, thank you for is, having uh, us. We've all, all of us read it and it's very clear, of course. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is the opportunity that you have to speak to it and we uh, welcome you being present to do that. Thank you. Okay. Kia ora tato. My name is Bethany Baker and I'm the Conservation Projects Delivery Person for the Styx Living Laboratory Trust. And I'll be presenting our submission today on proposed Plan Change 7 on behalf of the Trust. Before getting into our submission, I'd like to provide a brief overview of who the Styx Living Laboratory Trust is. We are a local river care group who are passionate about protecting the Styx, Puharakeke Nui and its environs. We are advocates for maintaining water quality and other values, including drainage, ecology, landscape, cultural, recreation and heritage values in the river. We care deeply about our water and want it to remain clean, healthy, biodiverse and available for future generations to use and enjoy. The Styx River and its tributaries are a spring-fed river ecosystem, skirting on the northwest edge of Christchurch. The river originates and the suburb of Harewood is a dry swale, intermittently filled with stormwater. Springs feed the river as it meanders north eastwards through res residential, horticultural, agriculture, agricultural and lifestyle developments, as well as conservation reserves. And it discharges 30 kilometres away into Brooklyn's lagoon in the Waimakariri. The Styx is approximately 24.8 kilometres in length and has two main tributaries. The entire catchment covers an area of approximately 7,000 hectares. Over the past 150 years, the Styx River and associated waterways and wetlands have been extensively modified through the use of land use practices such as farming and drainage activities. The river's location on the northern edge of the Christchurch city also means that the Styx River is coming from increasing pressure from urbanisation. Although the Dix River system has been highly modified with few remaining remnants of native vegetation. It retains core wetland habitats and acts as an ecological corridor for upstream and downstream migration of birds, fish and invertebrates and is an important source of Mahingakai. The trust, which was established in 2000 to achieve Vision 3 of the Christchurch City Council's Styx Vision 2000-2040, um, and Vision 3 is to develop a living laboratory that focuses on both learning and research. The Trust for 20 years has since encompassed a role of guardianship and advocacy for the waterway and the biodiversity of the surrounding land is, part, is a living part of the Canterbury landscape. Representatives with educational, cultural, research and community interests including representatives from local government bodies are appointed to a board of management by the voluntary trustees to administer the aims of the Trust. We are supported through MOUs through multiple organisations and every year we run up over 2,000 volunteer hours through our programmes, including forest restoration, water quality, bird monitoring, education programmes and community events such as Summer in the Sticks and Matariki in the Sticks. We also act actively support the four other visions of the Christchurch City Council's Sticks Vision 2000 to 2040, including Vision 1, achieving a viable spring fed ecosystem, Vision 2, creating a source to sea experience, Vision 3 is the one that we're focused on, which is developing a living laboratory, Vision 4 is establishing the sticks as the place to be, and Vision 5 is partnerships. So that's a brief overview of the trust, and I'll now present the submission. So the Sticks Living Laboratory Trust generally supports uh, 
the intention and direction of the proposed changes to the Canterbury Land and Water Regional Plan. So from part A, concerning the habitats of indigenous freshwater species, we strongly support the mapping of indigenous freshwater species habitats as this should provide greater clarity regarding the values of each area. We also strongly support stock exclusion and the required assessment of potential effects of water abstraction on indigenous freshwater species habitats and the safe passage of indigenous fish as discussed in 4.102. However, we oppose uh, the, unless, the unless clauses that are stated as parts A and B of 4.101. So the part A, um, part of the clause, is we don't believe that mitigation is strong enough. Our concern is that this phrase will still allow for sediment discharges, vegetation clearance, excavation and deposition of material or other disturbance in a surface water body to still occur. And therefore there will be effects on indigenous freshwater species habitats, but they will simply be mitigated. Therefore we argue that stronger provisions are required. So part B, which we also um, oppose, is the new habitats creation offset policy. We do not support the creation of new habitats as a mechanism to offset habitat destruction. Freshwater ecosystems are complex and this provision will allow for the destruction of valuable indigenous freshwater species habitats as long as a new habitat is created. This created habitat will, would not necessarily exhibit the same values of natural habitat as we worry that it is as the natural habitat and we worry that it would create a precedent for the destruction of our current valuable indigenous freshwater species habitats. So that's the part that we oppose. And then in relation to our other sections of part A, um, we strongly support um, the clauses in relation to Naitahu, the improved recognition of values and sites of significance. Uh, the provisions designed to protect Waipuna, including the integration of these sites into farm management plans. In terms of fresh water sites, uh, we su strongly support Schedule 6, uh, particularly the stock exclusion to help increase water quality at the sites. Uh, the salmon spawning, we also support the Schedule 17 and the identification of salmon spawning sites. And we support the national direction. Um, the alignment with the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. So moving on to Part C for the Waimakariri, our nitrate priority areas, minimum flows and allocation. We support the specific um, nutrient regimes and increasing of minimum flows over time as allocation is scaled back, but notes that the proposed stage element, implementation of changes occurs over a long duration and the timetable could be amended so that proposed changes could become operative sooner. A speedier implementation is needed for a timelier restoration to full ecological health and Māori in effective waterways so that these ecosystems do not decline further during the staged implementation. The Trust seeks an amendment of the timetable for improvements so that the proposed changes can become operative sooner. In section C, um, in the Wai Makariri, we also strongly support the allowance of water allocation for Mahinga Kai enhancement, greater provisions around stock exclusion from waterways, a shorter consent duration and review period, and progress reports on the implementation and effectiveness of this plan every five years. So to summarise, the main concerns for us were around mitigation, the habitats offset policy, in the time frame of staged implementation. Thank you for letting me read our submission on behalf of the Trust, and thanks for having me here today. Um, <coughs> we're grateful to you for a uh, uh, summary of the Trust's positions, and uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, how many people are actively involved in the business of the Trust? Oh. Um, we have about, I'd say, 500 a year, um, depending on our volunteer days that we run. Uh, we have quite a few volunteers, largely like school groups, etc. Um, we just had 100 people out at one of our sites. Um, so I'd say mainly about 500 people actively planting 
um, per year. Thank you very much. If you just pause for a moment, my colleagues may have some questions for you as well. Commissioner Solomon. Um, yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Ms Baker. Um, I enjoyed hearing your submission and I have been to the Sticks Living Laboratory a number of years ago and it was really impressive. So great work there, you're doing great work there. Um, I want to take you back down to part C, the Waimakariri and the, in your table, the, this, the bottom box, where it says a speedier implementation is needed for a timely restoration to full ecological health and Modi in affected waterways so that ecosystems do not decline further during the staged implementation, which is commendable. The Trust seeks an amendment of the timetable for improvement so that proposed changes can become operative sooner. Um, what would your shorter time frames be that would also provide for the economic and social well-being of the farming community? Um, honestly, the, the Trust um, didn't uh, haven't established such time frames um, or have any recommendations regarding that um, we would just support a speedier implementation I could get back to you after consulting other people from the trust but I can't speak to that for myself that. yeah thank you that's all from me Mr. Van Yes, Thank you, and uh, good morning. You raised um, policy 4.101 in your submission. I'm not sure if you're aware, the Regional Council staff have recommended to us in response to the submission of the Canterbury Conservation Board that parts A and B that were of concern to you be deleted. Had you caught up with that? No, I wasn't aware of that. Yes, I imagine that would make you happy in terms of your submission. Um, I was aware of the, that there was a do you mean that they were similar, the submissions? No, in no, that in regard? response to the um, submission of the Conservation Board, the staff had recommended to us that we delete clauses A and B. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm also a member of the Canterbury Aldecky Conservation Board. Right. Um, so that'll be, as well, I wasn't aware that that had been called to be deleted. So yep. So I imagine positive. that would meet your concern? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we're very grateful to you for preparing this submission and for coming today to speak to it. Thank you very much indeed. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. The next submission that we are going to hear this morning is uh, Mr. Graham Fenwick. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Good morning to you. We uh, have uh, read with interest the submission that you lodged. Thank you for taking the trouble to do that. And we've also uh, read the evidence statement that you produced for us. And so thank you for that as well. Uh, this is the opportunity for you to uh, speak to those two. And uh, then we may have some questions for you as well. Thank you, thank you. Um... So my name is Graham Fenwick. I um, have worked for more than 40 years as a scientist, uh, an ecologist, and um, uh, retired about three years ago uh, and continue to have an er uh, some interest in the area of groundwater biodiversity and groundwater ecosystems. Um, I've prepared this submission on my own behalf, um, but... Uh, um, I've gained a lot of knowledge through my employment with NIWA that how I've brought to, to this submission. Um, so I guess um, the area that I broach is probably a really quite a difficult one and that uh, fundamentally I am asking Environment Canterbury 
to change the way that it manages groundwater. Um, my understanding, my perception from um, interacting with uh, ECAN and uh, its policies um, and, and plans is that it manages groundwater as a physical resource with chemical properties. I believe that we need to move to managing groundwater as, an eco as ecosystems in much the same way that rivers are managed uh, throughout New Zealand and the world. The reason for that is that, that um, Canterbury's groundwater has um, abundant and diverse biodiversity, and that biodiversity um, performs important ecological processes and delivers ecological services to, to the people of Canterbury. So, and, and I, um, I note that the, uh, some of the technical advice uh, provided in the Section 42A report, um, if I just read from that, uh, there is a sentence which reads, in summary, Canterbury's groundwater ecosystems exist and, and are a vital part of the natural environment. Um, so clearly the, the technical advice received um, concurs with, with my view on this. Just let me interrupt to ask you if, if you would just give us the citation to that passage from the Section 42A report you've just read to us. Um, uh, it is uh, on pages, I think it's on page... Uh, somewhere in 152, 152, 153, 154, in that area. Thank you very much. And I have the number um, 75759 75, alongside it. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but please, no, that, please that's continue. Fine. That's fine. So, um, I believe that... <coughs> My, my submission is focused principally around um, managed aquifer recharge and, and threats posed by, um, by managed aquifer recharge through groundwater ecosystems. Um, so, uh, and I guess what I'm seeking um, through my submission points is that we uh, approach um, MA as if we were approaching um, water diversions in a stream or river in the surface water body, that groundwater ecosystems must be treated as uh, at least equivalent to rivers, uh, lakes and wetlands. After all, they are Canterbury's largest freshwater ecosystem. Um, they occupy uh, something around 27 per cent well, they underlie something like 27% of the Canterbury region, and no other water, water environment um, is so extensive. In fact, I understand that 80% of New Zealand's groundwater resides within our region. Therefore, it's really important that we begin to manage groundwater ecosystem, groundwaters as ecosystems. Environment Canterbury has uh, noted the presence of biodiversity um, in its land and water regional plan uh, since uh, around 2005, um, but has taken no steps to um, begin to manage groundwaters as ecosystems since that time. Hence, I've put quite a bit of time into this submission and, and um, and, and uh, into understanding uh, what um, legislation uh, and national policies and objectives um, are relevant to uh, some of the activities um, proposed or the policies proposed in, in Plan Change 7. So uh, rather than getting into reiterating all of the detail, which I think have been laid out fairly carefully for you in my evidence, um, uh, I'm happy to answer questions if that will help. Alternatively, I've prepared 
a, about a 20 slide presentation which is more, which would provide a more generic introduction to groundwaters as ecosystems, if that was uh, of use to you. I think that it would be uh, a good idea if you would present that to us now, and then we'll come to questions that we would like to ask. Okay. But our questions will be uh, better informed if we uh, see the presentation that you've prepared for us. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. So, um, that's very clear. So, uh, uh, so I'll run quickly through um, the, these five five topics, um, and and just by way uh, of giving us a bit of an overview. Of, of groundwater ecosystems. I'm going to start with a little bit on groundwater hydrology, although I, under, I suspect you already know quite a bit about that, and, and it's not my core area of expertise by any means. So um, aquifers are really uh, uh, are the matrix within which groundwater lies. And in Canterbury, we have uh, vast alluvial aquifer systems under the plains. Um, and, and, these, uh, the, and the groundwater flows through the interstices within this porous medium um, to, to, uh, towards the sea from, from the foothills. We talk about um, there being a water table, and that's uh, the level at which, uh, to which groundwater reaches um, below, below ground. And there are various types of, of um, of aquifers, but the key points I want to make are that water flows from higher to lower piezometric pressures. That is, if we've got a higher altitude, if the water, the water table is at a higher altitude at one point compared with at another, then it will tend to flow from that higher altitude to the lower altitude, just like a river. The flow rate is determined by that difference or the pressure difference, um, but also by the porosity of the aquifer itself and the flow rate uh, and the time that groundwater spends uh, uh, underground um, differs quite, quite considerably. Um, in Canterbury uh, we have waters of, of uh, considerable age. Um, the groundwater under, Canterbury, under Christchurch that is used for domestic supply, I understand, um, is underground for between 8 and 80 years. So if we were to put this um, relationship between water level and what's called the hydraulic conductivity or the porosity of the groundwater into a, a, a little uh, diagram like this, we see that water level and the hydro hydraulic conductivity determine the water velocity, that is the speed with which the water travels through the ground. Uh, and that has quite important cons consequences, as we'll see. So while water is underground, it undergoes a series of changes. So where water enters the ground, it's recharged, and then when groundwater uh, leaves the groundwater, it is discharged. So during that process, uh, minerals within the rocks of the aquifer itself tend to be dissolved out, particularly silicon, sodium, potassium. Other substances, such as dissolved oxygen, um, tend to be used up and utilised. Um, some nutrients, such as nitrate, become uh, uh, reduced. So nitrate will exist in its oxidised form at close to the recharge point, but as it stays underground, um, it will be reduced to um, nitrite, ammonia, ammonium, um, which tend to be more toxic, and that's shown in the in the um, second, the fourth bar from the left. Um, organic carbon um, is another substance. Now, organic carbon. Let me just digress for a moment. Ecosystems on la on the land surface are dependent on photosynthesis um, and photosynthetic plants 
which fix uh, energy from sunlight to provide organic carbon that they can feed on and digest. In the groundwater, there is no sunlight. There are no green plants. Therefore, um, groundwater ecosystems are dependent on organic carbon, which is dissolved and in fine particles being carried into the groundwater uh, at recharge points. So organic carbon tends to be used up as, as, uh, the, uh, as water uh, ages or stays underground. Um, and then uh, superimposed on that, we have land use effects, which tend to be minimal, close to the recharge point, but they tend to be, um, they tend to be greater uh, further downstream um, as the, or, or the longer the um, water stays underground. Now, I don't want to get too much into chemistry, um, and, and it's certainly not my area of expertise, but one of the interesting things that happens is that where we've got abundant oxygen or we have oxic environments, um, then, then um, as respiration proceeds, then, um, uh, sorry, in, in oxic, envi oxic environments, respiration uses, uh, produces as a byproduct CO2 and, and water. Um, where we get low oxygen or hypoxic and anoxic, where there's no dissolved oxygen in the water, uh, we get other changes happening. Um, so the, the microbial populations that are present when they respire and live, they um, result in, in, they reduce nitrate to nitrite and to ammonia and ammonium. Um, we get um, manganese becoming, uh, being reduced and going into solution, which can uh, taint groundwater. We get iron uh, compounds, again, being reduced and going into solution, again, tainting the groundwater. We get uh, sulfates um, being reduced and we get um, hydrogen sulfide, that is the rotten egg smell, again, um, tainting water, and, and at extreme environments we get carbon dioxide um, being converted into methane, and, and, and again that uh, uh, has adverse consequences for groundwater. So the, the biology, uh, un, um, the, the microbes in the groundwater um, perform these transformations. Again, if we put that into into a flow chart or a diagram of the way the system works. We've got recharge water entering the ground, uh, groundwater at the top, it influences the water level. The aquifer has its own hydraulic conductivity. Those two determine water velocity and therefore the age, the time at which water spends underground. That drives the amount of dissolved oxygen that's present. And then the biological processes uh, uh, switch from one type to another down this redox ladder um, depending upon the amount of oxygen that's available. Well, so, so that's the little bit of groundwater hydrology and hydrochemistry that I wanted to touch on. We'll come back to that. Why are these things, uh, why is the groundwater biodiversity and the groundwater ecosystems important? So most life underground uh, exists as is, is, is biofilms, or these are bacteria and fungi bound into, into slime layers on all surfaces. So clay-sized particles up to boulders have these, develop these, these biofilms quite quickly. Um, and, and you've all been in rivers and you've turned over rocks and you've felt that the underside's slimy. That's, that's a biofilm. When we don't clean our teeth, we get biofilms on our teeth. Biofilms are universal phenomena in wet environments and, and they cause a lot of problems for, for the food processing industry and a whole bunch of other things. So in groundwater, we can get biofilms developing and if things get out of control, then those biofilms can get out of control. There's a whole bunch of invertebrates living down there. Now these are animals that, invertebrates that spend their entire life histories underground, and I'm talking about 20, 30, 40, 100 metres underground, in the groundwater. They, <coughs> they range from infinitely small up to about 25 millimetres long in Canterbury's groundwater. 
They universal wherever we've, wherever we've got oxygen in the water, and some of them are adapted to living in um, very low or no oxygen environments as well. So here we've got a bunch of crustaceans. We've got a whole suite of other things. We've got paramecium, amoebae, copepods, um, mites, uh, water beetles, uh, various worms, uh, a whole diversity. So there's a whole lot of sizes and shapes, and they have a lot of diverse feeding modes. And in fact, it turns out that there's a whole ecosystem down there. Now, at one well in Canterbury, we have discovered more than 50 species there. Most of them are new to science. So how much biodiversity do we have? Well, it's very difficult to determine because almost all of them are completely unknown to science. We've recently conducted some DNA work that shows us that in every aquifer you look at, now the columns in this table, I apologise you can't read it, but every column in this table represents a different aquifer. And the lines are the different species that we've been able to identify using DNA. And what we find is that most of those species live in only one aquifer. Okay? So they're endemic, not just to New Zealand, not just to Canterbury, but to individual aquifers. So if we go from the Waimak Ashley Aquifer to the, the next one along, which uh, lies around the Selwyn and the Rakaia rivers, we've got a completely different set of animals. They're endemic to those particular areas. So that that's, means that they're quite special sort of animals. OK, so we've talked a little bit about what's in groundwater in terms of the biology. Why are they important? I apologise that this is not particularly bright. Um, we'll come back to it shortly. Um, so just to run, talk through it from the middle and the top there, the top green panel, water percolating from the soil surface carries with it organic carbon and fine particular organic carbon. That gets bound into these organic carbon or biofilm layers on all of the sediment particle sizes. There are bacteria or microbes in the biofilms, and those biofilms tend to be browsed by these invertebrates, by these crustaceans, these beetles, those sorts of things. There are predators present, so there's a lot of that predation happening in there. They produce faeces and death, which recycles some of the organic carbon and goes back into the microbes and it cycles around. The red arrows off to the right indicate that all of these bacteria and, and invertebrates and in their lives are respiring. They're releasing from the whole system um, carbon as carbon dioxide. So this is generally the way that the ecosystem uh, works. Now, if we think about the biofilms, they can build up. And uh, they start off really small and get thicker and thicker. Um, and it, under extreme conditions, they can begin to clog fine particles, fine pore spaces. So we talked about the porosity or the transmissivity of an aquifer. So the bacteria and these biofilms have the potential to actually begin to change that transmissivity. If it reduces the transmissivity, reduces the pore spaces, the velocity slows down. The velocity slows down, the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water slows down, uh, is reduced because because it takes longer for the water to move through the system. What do the, animal, the invertebrates do? They keep the biofilms in check. This is a big 20-millimetre uh, long uh, isopod called Phreatoicus that lives in the Canterbury Plains. It's endemic to the, to the, to the aquifers here. Um, and, and it just goes around, and all it does is it eats fine clay-sized particles and it just poos clay particles, but without the biofilm off it. It digests the, back, the biofilm off, off the clay-sized particles. A lot of the other invertebrates feed on browsing the surfaces of bigger particles, of the boulders, the stones, keeping the biofilms in check. And by keeping the biofilms in check, they're helping to keep the dissolved oxygen or the water flowing, and therefore the dissolved oxygen levels higher. So if we can put all that together, we've got the recharge water at the top, we've got nutrients carried in, we've got the DOC, FPOC, DOC, or dissolved organic carbon, and the fine particular organic carbon gets bounded to biofilms. The invertebrates called 
collectively called the Steiger fauna feeds on that, and that feeding activity and their movement help to stimulate the, the biofilms to take up organic carbon. But they, the Steiger fauna is dependent on having abundant dissolved oxygen, but if the dissolved oxygen gets too, too low um, through water level changes or changes in the water and the velocity, then the uh, respiratory system clicks over and we get the redox, go down the redox ladder, so rather than the uh, respiratory products being water and carbon dioxide, they become nitrite, ammonia and ammonium, um, or manganese or iron products, then those substances become uh, toxic to the Steiger fauna. So if they're toxic to the Steiger fauna, we begin to get a cycle of happening where dissolved oxygen will reduce even further because the Steiger fauna can't do their cleaning activity, the biofilms get out of check, water velocity slows down, dissolved oxygen goes lower, and we can get this uh, bit of cycling going on, um, and, and things can be quite harmful. So this whole system underground is somewhat similar to we see what we see in um, the trickling filter part of an engineered wastewater system. I won't to dwell on that, but, but it is uh, well recognised that that's what happens. So in the process, this whole groundwater ecosystem performs these vital ecosystem services. The biofilms concentrate and metabolise contaminants. The Steiger fauna removes and, and metabolises a lot of the organic carbon. It digests some, some of the bugs. The Steiger fauna feeding and movement is termed bioturbation. It can unclog and maintain finer pore spaces. That helps to maintain the aquifer flow uh, and the, uh, the velocity of the groundwater. And that helps to maintain the oxic environments or the oxygenated environments in the groundwater. So that's really quite important for helping to sustain the groundwater quality and its availability, our ability to get groundwater out to use. So, what are the threats? Well, numerous threats. Anything, essentially, anything that gets onto the land surface gets into the groundwater. And, okay, that's too difficult to see. Um, what happens is that um, if we think about, um, if we think about, uh, substances such as nitrate, they are a resource for bacteria, and most bacteria will begin to utilise uh, nitrate in one way or another. But as the and as they will, as the concentration increases, that will stimulate microbial activity up to some point, beyond which it will begin to inhibit microbial activity. Hence, we get a, a, a curve uh, shaped uh, here. Uh, for some, for for the Steiger fauna, however. Um, the nitrate, rather than being a resource, is something of a contaminant or a toxicant. Um, so at lower levels, lower concentrations, it's relatively inert from the point of view of the Steiger fauna's activity. But as the concentration increases, it will tend to suppress the Steiger fauna activity. So nitrate um, has, has a, a potential to be a bit of a problem in groundwater, along with a suite of other uh, contaminants. So what happens when, what do we see when we get um, uh, the Steiger fauna being inhibited in groundwater? On the right hand side, we've got a sieve with showing the sediments out of a well oxygenated well. These are dredged from the bottom of the well and you see they're brown and they're free draining. And, and this is typical uh, of, of uh, oxygenated, healthy ox oxygenated ecosystems and environments. On the left, however, we've got uh, sediments out of the same well um, at a different time when, it, uh, when the water level had dropped away, so the velocity had diminished and there had been high loadings of organic carbon into the system. We see that it's not free draining, it's clogged. We see that it's dark in colour, indicating the presence of hydrogen sulphide, that, that, uh, that rotten egg smell and byproduct, and we see the carcasses of, of some, a few little animals in there, little white flecks. 
So, so we do see these things happening um, on, on small scales in, in, in when, when the ecosystem uh, health deteriorates as a result of changes in the physical environment. We can put it all together into a big diagram and show um, the feedbacks and things like that, and, and I think I've, you've, I included that in, in my evidence, um, um, so I, I won't dwell on that at the moment um, in, in the interest of, of just keeping moving. Um, importantly, though, um, we've noted up, the, in the, up at the top there, second from the left, the box, recharge, irrigation, managed aquifer recharge, they can uh, influence the hydraulic conductivity, uh, or they provide, they provide water, uh, so they can influence the water level. Um, that can influence the, wa the water velocity, um, but they can also influence the hydraulic conductivity, particularly if it introduces uh, a new source of nutrients, particularly organic carbon, and stimulates my, uh, the biofilm activity. So, so MA is not... Um, uh, can, can, can influence the, the whole uh, functioning of that ecosystem. Um, so I've talked, uh, there are critical interactions that we've talked about and, and are here that I've just picked them out to be, uh, show, show them. Um, so the uh, blue arrows show the, the um, so we start on the left with the transmissivity, the water level and the groundwater velocity. They influence, they influence um, the organic carbon content, the amount of dissolved oxygen, the uh, redox uh, reactions happen in there. Um, toxicants such as nitrate and ammonium also influence things, so too do other solutes. But also we see that the biofilms influence transmissivity and the Steiger fauna influences the biofilms as well as, uh, as, well as influencing the transmissivity directly. Okay, so the potential effects of water transfers man via managed aquifer uh, recharge, um, change in water levels, flow directions and velocities, um, some of those can be beneficial, some of them might be adverse. They can change the water chemistry and there's a vast number of substances um, in water that, can, uh, that, that Ma could influence. Uh, Ma could also influence clogging and or, or transmissivities by introducing fine particles, by stimulating my, uh, the biofilms. They can result in res, uh, reduced dissolved oxygen and, and ultimately uh, there is a potential for them to influence uh, water quality in that way. They can also influence um, groundwater ecosystems via the accidental introductions of some of these, in, some Steiger forms, some of these invertebrates, via either direct or indirect connections with adjacent aquifers. So animals um, and plants the world over have this propensity over time to go places. So we've heard about uh, beetles that cross the Tasman um, on, on floating logs and debris, that butterflies that get carried in high altitude currents and cross the Tasman. Um, we find that Fishes get all sorts of places that we don't expect them to get. Uh, and the same is true with, with uh, invertebrates. So in the case of, of managed aquifer recharge, once we create a connection maybe from, from a, a river in, above one aquifer uh, to, um, a, to, a, to, to a, a, a well above another aquifer, then there's potential for groundwater to migrate into the connection, whether that be a canal or a pipe, and over time migrate down into the new aquifer. Um, so, so there is that potential for those sorts of transfers to, to occur. When that happens, then we get some biodiversity loss via hybridisation, um, and, and we change the, the biodiversity. We may introduce uh, species that that um, that that will change the entire, the entire ecosystem in some way also. So um, it's important for us then to recognise that groundwater is, uh, is fundamental to surface waters because most surface water is fed by groundwater in some way. 
um, that groundwater and surface water bodies are usually connected, um, that groundwater is habitat for significant and valuable biodiversity, and much of that's endemic to single aquifers. This biodiversity comprises functional ecosystems. These ecosystems provide vital groundwater uh, uh, services by maintaining uh, groundwater quality and um, making sure that the groundwater flows are there so that we can actually pump out the groundwater that we need for our activities. And that groundwater biodiversity faces a whole bunch of threats from human activities, including breaching natural barriers um, to, through, to different aqu between aquifers. So the implications for managing groundwater then is that we must begin to manage groundwaters as ecosystems. Biodiversity drives aquifer yield and transmissivity. It also drives water quality, but conversely, um, if we change uh, water quality, then we can affect the biodiversity and the ecosystems as well. So, so that's really the, the, the background um, to, to, uh, to, to my entire submission. Um, and, and, and it's for those reasons that I urge you um, to uh, consider the points that I raise, um, that we really need to change the way that we manage groundwaters. They are ecosystems. They have their own endemic biodiversity. That in biodiversity, in most, in most cases, appears to be confined to individual aquifers. It makes it short-range endemism. Um, so, so in many ways, that endemism is greater than we see with our, with our freshwater fishes. Well, Mr. Fennick, thank you very much for the uh, trouble you've taken in preparing those slides for us and for, for the commentary on them. Uh, would, may I ask if you could give the file or provide the file that contains those slides to the uh, hearing manager yes, we'll do so that, that uh, we can have access to it further? Yes. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, I think my colleagues and I will, will have one or two questions Please. for you, uh, if we may pass to that now. Is that convenient for you? A absolutely. Uh, I welcome your questions. Please. Thank you. Commissioner Van Voorthuizen. Yes, thank you and good morning. Um, don't have any questions from your primary evidence because you've largely traversed it again in your, in your uh, rebuttal, I mean your submission, you've traversed it again in your rebuttal evidence. Yep. Um, so just turning to that, have you got that with you? Uh, yes. Yes, so paragraph 4.5.5. Yes. And my question is, how would one do that? Okay. So, um, I... Uh, So um, there are the, the conventional way to do that is to go and and uh, do some fairly extensive collecting um, at the um, Ma site um, and at the source site um, to um, and compare the the Steiger faunas that you might that you might have to to see whether they, in fact they are similar or different. Um, and that can be done via um, uh, the, the, the usual approach of um, taking samples and looking at them in a microscope. So you need highly trained people to be able to do that. The, the emerging way to do that is to actually use uh, DNA analyses to compare the, the faunas between the, the two sites. Um, so that, that's one way to, to, to simply look at it from a biodiversity point of view, uh, other ways to uh, uh, ways to look at the ecosystem functioning is uh, to um, compare the uh, compare measures of um, ecosystem processes by using uh, the likes of uh, decay of cotton strips as a standard approach that's been used uh, both in groundwater. It was developed for use. In, in, uh, in rivers um, and, and measure the rates at which they decay over time. Um, 
and compare that with, with what you'd be finding uh, in, in, the, in the source area. Um, the, uh, some comparison of um, microbial communities would be uh, required also, um, in addition to uh, comparing water quality um, on the traditional um, uh, attributes that groundwater managers use, we should be looking using a whole suite of attributes that are relevant to ecosystems and ecosystem uh, comparisons. So water chemistry is a part of it, uh, it's certainly not the complete picture. Um, there, are, um, there are publications around that detail these approaches um, uh, particularly they've been used quite extensively and developed quite extensively in Australia. Uh, some of those have been trialled in New Zealand. Um, um, yeah, so, so they are available. Um, and, and as with most um, evaluation and monitoring technologies, um, they become refined through application and usage. And so we must start somewhere and, and, and uh, then the, the, me the methods and techniques will be refined further. So given the, um, your evidence regarding the endemic nature of the stygoforma, in particular aquifers, in terms of what you're saying to us, are you seeking to avoid the use of groundwater for ma, or are you us seeking that only groundwater from the same aquifer be used and the same aquifer. Yeah, so um, I'm, uh, I believe, uh, yeah, I'm seeking that, um, that water from above the same aquifer be used. So uh, water from above the aquifer within which, to which it's being moved should be used. So we should not traverse, uh, whether we use groundwater or surface water, um, is less important than actually uh, ensuring that the water is from within the same aquifer uh, area. So, for example, if if the if we think about the uh, the Ashley Waimakariri aquifer, then we should uh, the source water, whether it be um, from groundwater or surface water, should um, be within that aquifer. If we're going to put it into that aquifer. Just looking at your 4.5.18. Yep. And the words in italics, adverse effects on biodiversity, ecosystem and ecosystem processes are eliminated. Eliminated is an unusual word in yep. RMA context. We're more used to words like avoided, remedied, or mitigated, or, or words like that. What What do you mean by eliminated, and how would that be achieved? Uh, I, I, in reviewing and rereading that last night, um, I noted eliminated was an unusual word, and I, I apologise for that. Probably avoided is is a better better term. And to achieve um, avoidance, would you need to do what we just discussed in terms of um, being careful about the source of the recharge of the ma water? Correct, yes, okay. yes. Um, that in part, um, I, I think we also need to, to uh, we need to um, look at some of those other aspects, both the, um, both the biodiversity, um, and the ecosystem processes to, to ensure that we're, we're being, being consistent on that. And similar sort of issue, just last question, um, or second to last question, 4.6.5. The application must explicitly demonstrate that no adverse effects on etc are occurring, which is an avoid outcome, which you've yes. just clarified. Yes. And you've talked about how one might go about um, investigating or assessing potential impacts, but to ensure that these impacts were avoided, what, what would one need to achieve? So let's say 
you, you looked at your source water, you, you did some of the comparison of ecosystem processes, et cetera. Yes. We did the things that you've just outlined. What would, need, what would need to be the result of that to achieve this avoidance outcome? Um, firstly, that, that the biodiversity was, uh, that they were from a biological perspective within the same aquifer, so we're, we're not um, transfer, we would, ha we would have no risk of transferring fauna from one aquifer to another. Um, secondly, that we were not um, introducing uh, contaminants, um, we were not introducing substances that would have an adverse effect on the destination aquifer. It would primarily be on this uh, stygofauna? It would be on the stygofauna, but also the microbes. The microbes mm -hmm. are, yeah, are, are probably mo more robust, or, um, yeah, the microbes are more robust. It's the stygofauna that really controls the system, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, <laughs> this has been trialled in New Zealand. Where was that and who did that? In terms Sorry. of, an, you, you've mentioned that investigating these issues or looking at potential impacts on uh, groundwater ecosystems has been experimented with in New Zealand. Uh, where has that occurred and who's been doing that? Yeah, um, so um, the team at ESR, led by uh, Murray Close, um, have been doing quite a bit of work on uh, looking at a groundwater s ecosystem health. Um, measurement or assessment tools, uh, principally applying the methods developed in Australia by Corbell and Hose and others um, to, to the New Zealand situation. In what part of New Zealand were they doing that? In Canterbury. In Canterbury. Um, also some in Southland and, uh, yeah, they, yeah, they may be doing it, have tried some in other regions also. And final question, um, you've explained to us a lot about the, um, the nature of the ecosystems and the groundwater and the things that um, you suggest we might need to be thinking about to avoid adverse impacts on those. Is there any evidence that the current management regime is having an adverse effect on groundwater ecosystems? Um, um, no, no. Um, I, have to, I have seen some adverse effects, but those are historical. Um, the problem is that there is no monitoring program that looks at, uh, that, that could identify adverse effects on the, uh, on, the, on the groundwater ecosystem. And you mentioned some historical um, yeah. e evidence. What was that? Um, um, uh, well, that, that photograph I showed you of two brass sieves with sediments on it, that came from um, uh, an experimental site uh, at Templeton um, uh, where there used to be a wastewater treatment facility that discharged to, um, to uh, open fields uh, and where there was a series of wells uh, downstream of that. Well, thank you very much. That's the end of my questions, but just like to thank you for the way that you set out your rebuttal evidence in particular. It was useful the way you systematically went through and responded to the way the officers had responded to your submission, and that certainly made it um, easier to follow and, and to digest the information, so thanks for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, no, I want to thank you. Commissioner Solomon, do you have any questions? No, I don't, but I just want to thank Mr Fenwick for his really informative and... Um, absorbing submissions and I don't have any questions because you've already answered the questions that I had. Thank you. Mr Fenwick, there's another aspect of it that you might just touch on perhaps. Do we have any information about how sensitive the natural life of the groundwater is to certain quantities being abstracted? Is that, in other words, is, is it something where a small quantity might be abstracted, whatever small means, and have, have no significant uh, adverse effects? 
and, and how much does it have to be where you could be fairly confident there'd be adverse effects? Um, uh, we, we have very little information. It's actually quite challenging to get down there and see what's going on. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Hence this body shape. Um, um, there is, um, so firstly, uh, there is information from, from France uh, indicating that the, uh, the, um, the zone immediately around the, uh, the water table is uh, biologically more active than perhaps elsewhere in the aquifers in an aquifer. So that is the surface essentially. Um, is a, a more active biologically area. Um, secondly, um, there's uh, some lab experiments, uh, experimental work uh, showing that the rate at which your water level changes um, can, can have a quite profound effect on, on some of the stegofauna. So, uh, uh, clearly, some of these animals can migrate up and down. Um, so that if the rate of movement is too great, um, then then then, uh, um, then that that can have that can strand animals and, and result in their death. Um, but those are things that are likely to occur only over more localized scales. I suspect. Um, my my uh, view is that the. Um, the, the, the larger scale adverse effect is where we, where we uh, have significant drawdown over bigger areas and alter the, the gradient of the piezometric surface or of the water table and therefore reduce the velocity of the groundwater and then uh, I think that's where we get the greater, the greater um, harm occurring. So in an ideal world we might, we might um, take less water farther inland and concentrate our, um, our uh, abstraction closer to the coast or the point of discharge because that would have the effect of increasing the gradient. But, but, but that becomes impractical. Well, I uh, share with my colleagues uh, grateful thanks to you, Mr Fennick, for introducing us so uh, clearly and lucidly to uh, a new area of interest for us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, and uh, I, I wish you well with the challenge I've posed you. Thank you. Now the next submission that we would like to hear this morning is the submission of Robin Fraser. Today he's not he's not arrived. Not arrived? No. Well, perhaps we we'll go to uh, the the following submission. And if Mr. Fraser turns up, we can perhaps fit him, fit him in later in the morning. But we do have a busy morning. And so uh, I think we're going to address Dairy Holdings now. Did I see Mr. Williams? Uh, yes, sir, good morning. And I've also got some uh, Kirsty J. Kong who's appearing with me. So she's a new start solicitor at Chapman Trust, so learning about all things wonderful resource management. And I've got Colin Glass, who I think you've all met on a number of occasions before. 
and Neil Thomas. They're looking who, forward to meeting him again. <laughs> <laughs> who's giving but, but evidence. Before, before we get, the, get on to that, uh, you, you introduced your uh, assistant council, and I didn't catch their so, name. Kirsty Jacom, so J A C O M B. Thank you. Good morning and welcome, Mr. Jake. Good morning, David. Um, so in terms of context, as the panel's probably aware, I'm also presenting for Waimakariri Irrigation Limited and Fonterra Limited in due course. I'm very conscious of trying to be as efficient as possible. So in terms of the legal submissions as a part of the DHL case, I've generally stayed away, um, but that's certainly not to say they're not important and DHL doesn't have significant interest in them. The Waimakariri nutrient issues, um, at least at a regional scale, and also the T allocation versus A allocation or groundwater quantity issues in the OTOP area. So I haven't covered those in any detail at all, really, in the context of this case. Um, but certainly from an evidential perspective, I'm expecting questions of the witnesses potentially around those issues and no issues um, in supporting that from a legal position should questions arise. So, so I have obviously prepared some legal submissions. I'm not, I'm assuming the panel has read them um, on the basis yes. of pre-exchanged. So I'm not going to yes. um, yeah. touch on them probably but for any... Thank you for providing them in advance no. to give us the opportunity. <laughs> So I do have one correction to make, or one clarification to make to the evidence, or the submissions rather, which is, I'm going to probably keep this simple for you, which is just ask you to delete paragraphs 15 to 17. And then I'll explain the basis for this um, once you've done that. So I think you've all in other land and water regional processes, and it's certainly the subject of evidence here, um, heard both legal submissions and evidence on DHL's interest in farming enterprises. And that's been quite a significant part of the DHL story, if you like, in terms of particularly being able to drive to nutrient improvements and efficiency gains over time in a often quicker and more efficient manner than not having farm enterprises in play. So in terms of Plan Change 7, we've got Rule 8527 in the Wanakariri. The building fire alarm is about to be tested. Repeat, <laughs> building fire alarm is about to be tested. Please start following times. This is testing only. It seems I won't need to leave my chair. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> so, Just let us know, obviously, if you need to take a break, so as you will. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take a break for a f or can we? No, I don't think I need to leave. You don't need to leave? <laughs> So, uh, and then, just accept my apology and carry <laughs> And then, sorry, I'll just continue what I was saying. So, um, at the OTOP area, we've got 14520, so DHL has supported those, I think, in further submissions. So, um, Beef and Lamb was seeking reference, which is the paragraphs I've deleted to a nutrient user group. Um, DHL is relatively ambivalent to that and is satisfied with the existing farm enterprise rules. What is not in Plan Change 7 and is in the other sub-regionals is the equivalent to Policy 13417, um, which is one that was actually developed in the Plan Change 1 or Variation 1 context as it was then, off the back of a DHL submission regarding the formation and potential exit from farm enterprises and providing some clarity at a policy level how nutrients might be treated, um, particularly in the context of land uses potentially changing 
to, a, to an extent anyway, as a result of the farm enterprise and a where a consent no longer held for a farm enterprise, nutrients potentially needing to be looked at differently. So, so those submissions, for particularly one from Beef and Lamb and the further submission from DHL, are perhaps a basis for looking at the equivalent to a 13417. Um, certainly from my submission, it's not an essential cornerstone policy to have, but it has been, in turn in the plan change one context, it has proven to be quite helpful in terms of understanding how, how farm enterprises might work. So what I thought I might do at this point is turn to my Schedule 1. Now I do emphasise that there's one, two, three, four. Four points in this table. DHL has obviously submitted on a number of points, and you've and I've commented already on its position with regard to the Waimaka Rally provisions. I just want to emphasise again that certainly, although I've focused on these four points in my legal submissions, um, DHL certainly does have a strong interest in those other aspects. So, the points I wanted to talk through in the first instance was policy fourteen four twenty. So. I think DHL's original submission on this has perhaps been a little bit misinterpreted by the officers, but to provide some context... Uh, the building's fire alarm testing is now complete. Please acknowledge any further tones. Thank you. I'll carry on. Sorry. <laughs> so the context for the DHL submission on policy 14.420 is it holds a consent for a support property which we refer to as Coriston, which is near Mangati um, or Cannington at the, in the hill country of Timaru. So it's not a dairy platform, it's a support operation principally used for heifer grazing and some wintering support. Um, relative to end losses relative to what occurs on the Canterbury Plains um, and a sort of orthodox dairy platform are quite low, so it's, I think, 30, was consented at 30 kilos of N per hectare per year on the basis of version 6.3.0, I think, at the time. So as a part of that consent, um, the property was located, or is, was located in an orange zone, um, and on that basis, DHL was able to obtain a consent, you might recall, as per the original land and water regional plan provisions, which did allow some intensification, albeit limited, in some contexts. The concern we've got with policy 14420 is principally around B, um, and the nitrogen loss calculation remains below, and the actual core concern is below the lesser or be the good management practice loss rate. Sorry, Commissioner. There's a, there's a misspelling there. It's not a lesser or it's a lesser, is it? It should be a lesser. I'm wondering whether that's a cut and paste or a typo on my part. I apologise if it's a letter. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's not a matter of... It's just, just a matter of being sure that we understand what you're... Yeah. What you're so I think it's intended to be the nitrogen... Is. Yeah. Um, well, certainly our understanding of the B is that to comply with the policy on renewal, Coriston would need to demonstrate that its losses were less than the lower of the good management practice loss rate, which, of course, as the panel would be aware, is the farming activity carried out over the most recent four-year period um, with the additional words if operated at good management practice. So that is effectively consistent with the existing Coriston consent. Or the nitrogen loss calculation that occurred in the four years prior to 20 July 2019. Now, that's particularly problematic for Coriston, and I expect there are other consent holders in this context as well. So what happened was Coriston or DHL obtained the consent part way through that period, actually towards the end of that period. So it has legitimately and lawfully undertaken you know, a, some intensification, but if this B was applied correctly and we had to go with the less off one of those two, it would effectively have to ramp back its losses on the way through the renewal process, which of course is concern. And 
probably to put that into context as well, um, it's useful to refer to Rule 14.5.19, which is the rule that it would be consented under. The rule, I think, is correctly structured and does refer to the exception of um, unless a lawful exceedance occurred and doesn't have the, the problem introduced by B. So what I've done in Schedule 1 there is set out a potential separation of A and B, so you don't need to comply with both A and B, um, with perhaps some additional wording in A just to clarify the relevance of the lawful exceedance or the context for which lawful exceedance might be consented. Um, but equally, as I said, even, it would be possible to largely replicate the rule wording, i.e. 14.5.19, and avoid the issue. So I think, certainly from Corison's perspective, that's, a, I expect, unintended, but um, ramping back on behalf of the notified plan slash council, but certainly something we're very keen to see that it's addressed. Um, the next point on the table, which I've touch on is policy 1447 in the rules. Now, as I noted before, I'm appearing for Fonterra in due course on these aspects. And I also see more recently that the Council, via memorandum on 23 September, has revisited the actual groundwater allocation in the Rangatara Orton, or for that matter, all OTOP groundwater areas, and the extent of over allocation is perhaps with the exception of Periora and Upper Periora, which are um, not relevant to the DHL position. Certainly a lot less than what was anticipated at the time the plan was notified. Um, with, in the Rangatara Orton area, the percentage allocation being perhaps 115.4% of what's um, desired. So, as the panel's no doubt aware, the uh, prompted by the Zone Committee as much as anything, but the notified plan proposed a T allocation and then resource consents being potentially converting if they were shallow groundwater takes to this deeper T allocation over time. Um, some perhaps what was intended to be a very sophisticated transfer regime within the plan, I personally found very difficult to understand and looking at the evidence, um, a number of parties and experts concerned at the same. Now I think the officer's report has moved to the position of perhaps deleting the T allocation. In my submission that makes a lot of sense and certainly make things a lot easier and just to put that into a practical context, DHL's has a property in the Rangatara Orton area called Tata. Um, it's got a single groundwater consent and that consent enables takes from four take points, which are an extremely shallow gallery, a relatively shallow bore and then two deep bores all within the same consent. So applying a differential allocation regime, i.e. a T and an A allocation against, in that context, a single consent, would in my view be fraught with difficulties and or impossible. So certainly very supportive of the officer's change position of deleting the T allocation, relying on the A allocation. I think that makes a lot more sense, particularly when allocation, over allocation isn't anywhere near the extent we thought it was. But I'm still, to be honest, relatively unclear on what the council's final position on this is. Um, I'm hoping by the time I come to present the Fonterra case, I'm actually clear on the wording proposed and how it's going to work and the council's final position on this. And I, so um, that's probably what I need to say on that. The third point it was, I've got there is with reference to the planning maps and the Rangatara Orton High Nitrate Concentration Area. So. This is principally the subject of evidence from Mr Thomas. I'm not going to talk to it in any detail. So, um, Mr Thomas has put forward the suggestion of a differential nutrient reduction for what was previously the green zone. Um, so, as you'll recall from the evidence that appears, there's quite a difference across the proposed nitrate concentration area between the former red zone and the current green zone between relative 
nutrient levels or nitrate levels. Mr Thomas's suggestion is a small reduction perhaps should be contemplated in the green zone. Um, I think that is, would be a very much belts and braces approach um, with, in reality, some relatively localised water quality concerns on particularly McKinnon's Creek, perhaps being a justification for at least looking at a very small reduction or, in reality, I think going forward, weight also needs to be given to the fact changes on farm, including good management practice and basic standards like that, would also go a long way to hopefully addressing what may be required to address those localised issues. Um, one I'm not going to cover in any detail other than to say DHL will be adopting the due course. I expect my legal submissions on Wymac and and we're happy with the position being put forward in Ms Sullivan's evidence re changes to the provisions. Um, as you've seen in evidence and you've heard in other evidence from Mr Glass before, DHL <laughs> operates a highly efficient um, low input farming system um, which has gone a long way to achieving what this sub-region, regional and other sub-regionals have ultimately required or f all farming operations um, with operations that are already exhibiting what we commonly understand to be GMP and just picking up on an example of that which is in evidence as well in terms of um, synthetic nitrogen as it's now called, synthetic nitrogen fertiliser application. DHL has for quite a long period of time been reducing synthetic nitrogen so it's very close already to the point of meeting new NES freshwater 190 kilos of end limits. Um, and that's also been in the context of being very conscious of that this will become an emissions climate change issue in due course as well. Um, but the net position as DHL is in is it has very efficient, low input existing farming systems. It's being very proactive in terms of getting good management practice into play. There's very limited opportunity for it to make further reductions beyond what it's doing at the moment, but it certainly acknowledges the challenge to everyone in the Waikum Macarita context of addressing those water quality issues which have been identified, particularly in some surface water bodies. Um, DHL's either the largest or one of the largest shareholders in the Waimaka Irrigation Scheme, certainly from a shareholder perspective, is more than happy to put its hand up and contribute to the efforts that the scheme will go to in the future, but also sees it as being really important that all shareholders are treated equally and all shareholders are enabled in terms of ensuring that contribution can occur. So. And the final point was the nitrate mapping of the priority sub-areas. So it's been very unclear. So this is another green zone area of land being treated quite differently in the sub-regional process. Um, now, unlike the Rangatara Autumn context, we have struggled to see any basis for the officer's decision or the council's decision to change the mapping to include the green zone land, um, which is on a lower terrace by the Waimakariri River in the nitrate priority area in the Waimakariri context. So, um, in the absence of detailed explanation from the council as to reasons for the change, it's certainly DHL's position that given that it sits on a lower terrace and there's no apparent reason why it should be hydrologically connected to the balance of the nitrate priority area that perhaps the green zone should remain. So, so very much an overview of the case, that was all I was going to say at the moment. I'm happy to take any questions at any point of course, otherwise... I'm wondering whether uh, Wait, you might think witnesses. this would be a, an opportunity to, for me to ask a question or two about the submission itself. Of course, sir.
And just on that, and I think the hearing officer has probably updated you. I noticed in preparing for this case that DHL had done an addendum to its further submission following the notification of an addendum to the summary submissions by the council um, and just making sure you had that. So you should actually have a, an original submission, a further submission and then an addendum um, to the summary of decisions. Well, I certainly have the addendum. Ah, thank you. That was the one I was concerned about because it wasn't on the council website when I looked yesterday. So. Ah, yes. I think it well, now is on the website. So. I do have that. But I think I, there were one or two things that I wasn't clear about that you might help with yep. uh, in terms of the submission, the, the original submission itself. It, on page five, paragraph 47. Yep. If DHL is asking to be exempt from restrictions for improving water quality in an FMU on the basis of being some distance from their own operations. I'm wondering how that measures up to the NPS FM 2020 for setting environmental outcomes by FMUs because the, the 2020 uh, NPS doesn't contemplate achievement property by property or farm by farm, does it? Um, so a couple of points here, sir. So this is probably paragraph 14.7 relates to con two contexts. Um, one is the point I talked about before, re some of the former green zone area, I. Uh, at least to date, what's been a different zone being moved into the nitrate priority area for the Waimaki Rarity Zone. I certainly accept absolutely, sir, that it's appropriate to look at all farmland in New Zealand um, or all DHL properties on the basis that it will be managed as, um, as a part of an integrated process through the FMU process under the NPS FM. Now, the second context within which paragraph 14.7 is relevant is the, which you'll have received or will receive considerable evidence on in due course, is the current approach proposed in the nitrate priority area, which is effectively a patchwork of different reduction requirements, depending upon how relevant farmland was treated by the groundwater model. Now, in the context of DHL's farms, they are located quite some distance away from the likes of Silver Stream and the lowland surface water bodies that certainly are of significant concern. At the time of preparing our submission, we certainly were not clear on the interrelationship between farming activities which occur on DHL property um, alongside the Waimakariri River and the improvement of water quality in those lowland water bodies. Um, again, DHL is quite happy to contribute and be part of the Waimakariri Irrigation Scheme solution and acknowledges fully that that occurs in an FMU process but is also concerned to ensure that land use controls do reference the outcomes that are being sought through that FMU process. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
talks about limited changes that can be made without materially impacting on farm profitability. And there's something of a similar kind in 1412. A proposed re reduction requirement would most likely be beyond the point of viability. Is there a limit in the RMA or in the NPS of 2020 on what the Regional Council can do in requiring reduction of nitrate losses by reference to what might materially impact profitability of a private business? So. This obviously has to be looked at in the broad context of sustainable management per se in the first instance, so allowing people in communities um, to meet social and economic needs, but certainly fully acknowledging the NPS FM, and it's certainly not well understood and we don't have the benefit of any judicial consideration on it. The NPSM has perhaps further clarified or placed slightly different emphasis on outcomes. Um, certainly as I see it, the Regional Council can't shy away from ensuring the cornerstone NPSM in value of maintaining and improving water quality over time is complied with. There is inevitably a balance, even within the likes of the Tamana OTY, in terms of putting the water first and then people and communities and economic operations. So, so in a narrow context, to answer your question directly, it could decide in certain contexts, hypothetically, that the need to protect water quality outweighed the potential impact on farm profitability. Of course, what we do in Resource Management Act processes is, is try and strike a balance. And DHL is concerned that not so much in the context of its own personal operations, given that it's not subject to the very extensive re nutrient reductions that some areas are subject to, but that PC7 at the moment hasn't quite got that balance right. Um, but again, you know, DHL is concerned about the reductions proposed and wants to see they're justified on a water quality basis. So that was a long answer. But no, that's quite all right. You just take the time you need to explain it. Yeah. But I'm still having difficulty with the notion of balance uh, in yep. the way that uh, yep. the, the framework in which we need to work now yep. is different from what we used to work in 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, look, and 10 years ago, which... And if you wanted um, some judicial um, indications of it, you will have looked perhaps at the Bay of Plenty Regional Council decision of last year um, Federated Farmers and Bay of Plenty Regional, yep. uh, where they're suggesting that uh, people need to be accepting that they need to work towards uh, more sustainable activities. And, and I'm not for a moment denying that Dairy Holdings in particular has been uh, uh, working on that all the time that we've been hearing about it. But it's, it's a continuing process, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I certainly agree. So the sort of 10 year ago scenario, and I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking with DHL and I'm not saying DHL is in this context at all, but clearly we've resulted in a position in Canterbury where we've had over allocation. There were decisions made at the time where economic drivers 
possibly were, pl were given a lot of weight over water quality and water quantity outcomes. So if ended up in, in a situation where we have over allocation, the NPSFM 2017 and now 2020 has certainly changed that emphasis considerably where there is a strong and very clear direction um, consistent with the Bar Plenty case, which I'm familiar with but haven't read for a while, or things need to change and we're not shying away from that at all. And that might mean, and DHL certainly in this context, that farming has to make some change and in some cases you know, that will have an impact on farm profitability. Um, just looking at my paragraph 1411, materially perhaps wasn't the right word. Um, materially obviously implies that we don't want any impact at all. There is a scenario where there is an impact on farm profitability, but what we're trying to ensure is that change occurs in a sustainable manner and that the appropriate balance is struck between achieving those water quality and quantity outcomes which must be achieved and the pathway we get there which is enabling in the Waimakariri context farming operations ultimately to contribute as much as anything to achieving those outcomes through the likes of MAR and TSA. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to ask those questions at the stage, Mr. Williams. Thank you for your answers. Uh, is it convenient that shall we go to Mr. Glass? Uh, yep, or I'm, I'm happy to. Or um, I think Commissioner Van Borshausen's got his hand up for a question as well. So All right, but, but I'm happy to I go with your process. <laughs> so. Uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Van Voorthuizen to ask his questions now. Thank you. Um, first of all, just in terms of the first issue you raised, um, Policy 14420B, I just want to be clear, is your preference that um, Clause B would be amended to be consistent with Condition 2 of Rule 14519? I think that's what you were saying. You were saying the rule yeah, had it right. Yeah, the rule reads clearly, Yeah, and I think... There's more than one way to address this, obviously. I think, and it does make sense to have a policy that replicates the wording of the rule in terms of applying the policy in due course as well. So that would certainly be my preference. Um, but equally, splitting out A and B so you don't need to comply with both would work as well. So. Yeah. Um, now, turning to... Um Table 14ZB in the OTOP region, which oh. is where the groundwater allocation issue is that you discussed with us. Yeah. So I just let you turn to that first. Sorry, I've got six bundles of stuff in my bag here. That's why you got to help it. That's right. <laughs> Now, in your um, ZB, uh, ZB, ZB, Arari yep. to Muka, yeah, that one. Yep. Now, in your um, verbal presentation to us, you said you supported the officer's recommendation to remove the T block, but then you also referred to the 23rd September memorandum that's been tabled regarding that issue. So I assume you've got that and read that. Yep. Yep. And so in that memorandum, which doesn't have page numbers, which is unfortunate, but on page six of it is table one. Sorry, I'll have to count through the pages. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. I've got table one here. Yeah, yep. so that's yep. the table I think you were referring to. Yep. Now, I understand from your verbal presentation that your main interest is in the Rangitata Autumn yep. area, but I was just curious if when you've obviously read that memo and thought about it, on the next page there's the three bullet points, and Mr Thomas, you might want to think about this as well because I was going to ask you the same questions. Presuming that you've seen that memo, if you haven't, you can just say I haven't seen it. it makes your job easy. But um, Mr. Williams, in terms of those three bullet points, it appears to me that the one that would more closely align with the zone committee's aspirations would be the third one, which is to actually reintroduce a T block, where the T block would comprise 
the difference between what's in Table 1, the existing allocation limit, and the newly calculated allocation based on the new way of looking at the resource consent inventory, taking into account stream depleting tanks, etc. And so the difference would become a T block. Now that's quite different to what you were saying was your preferred approach. Have you given that any thought? Uh, yeah, and I, as I said, I'll be giving it more th thought in due course with Fonterra as well. This is r really, I've been really unclear on what the council's position is on this, and I think the fact that I've got three bullet points here, and I think they've genuinely put up options as well to the hearing panel. My preference for keeping things simple with a single allocation block, an A allocation block or whatever label we've put on it is, particularly in the specific context of DHL that I talked about where we've got a single consent that's probably taking water from what would be an A block and a T block with no volumetric restrictions or other limits between the various points to take under that consent, I've just got no idea how you would retrofit that consent taking water from both allocations potentially and or being treated a bit differently than everything else, particularly in the context of, you know, hypothetically, even though it's got four points to take, it can take all its water at the moment from either the shallow bores if it wanted to, which it doesn't, or the deep bores, um, obviously ignoring whether well performance and things would allow that. I keep coming back in the Rangitala Autumn context, and but equally it applies to four of the six other groundwater zones referred to, that over-allocation isn't anywhere near the extent of what we thought. And that if we're looking at 115.4% over-allocated in the Rangitala Autumn context, well, then maybe the orthodox approach, which applies elsewhere in Canterbury, or in other places in Canterbury, is a lot simpler in terms of as consents come up for renewal, looking at their existing annual volumes really hard and expecting a small ramp back over time. Because even in the notified AT block proposal, on my read, the council or the planning provisions were actually really unclear re how reductions were going to be achieved over time. So I think you're still driven back to a policy 4.5, Land and Water Regional Plan, look at the appropriate schedule and work out what a slightly reduced, more efficient annual volume might be on renewal of consents on the expectation that over time existing consents will reduce and meet the allocation limit. Sure, so what I take from that is your concern with um reintroducing a T block as per bullet three, which aligns with the zone committee aspirations for those groundwater zones that are not over allocated yeah. based on the new method. Your concern would be uncertainty about whether an existing consent would fall into the A block or the T block? Especially where a consent takes from what I, in any scenario I think would be both blocks. That might be a unique situation. I, I'd have to clarify that one with sure. the council, um, re where that consent might sit. So if the plan was to make it clear that existing consents comprise the A block and that the T block was a tail of only available for transfers from stream depleting groundwater to deeper groundwater, would, would that address that concern? Um, so in the Tata context, the shallow takes would be regarded as stream depleting. Mm -hmm. So I think there might have been minimum flow. There is even, there's an existing minimum flow on yeah, the yeah. surface water take under that consent. Yeah. It's probably the worst case scenario consent <laughs> to test it under these okay. rules. But I, I, I again come back to an Rangitala Autumn context, the risk of overcomplicating it and making it really unclear for the likes of the Tata property when all we're talking about, which I'm not saying it's not significant and it needs to change, but a relatively low level of over-allocation that um, can be managed through orthodox means. Stepping out of the DHL position, looking at Pariora and Upper Pariora, where clearly the 
groundwater allocation is still quite high, even on the recounting. Um, a T block, were it able to be administered, um, as per the zone committee aspirations, might well have more justification or be easier to justify in that context, but I'm still struggling to see how it actually works on a practical basis, because I think you're still left in the same context of there will be other consents out there like DHLs and how this actually operates in practice and how you lock up that T block for existing consents that are stream depleters. Bearing in mind, certainly from my own experience, um, there are a lot of consents out there which may not necessarily currently know that they're stream depleting and come consent renewal when well testing or pump testing is actually done, um, it will become apparent whether consents are stream depleters or not. Okay, thanks, and I think you um, said that you will hear some more from you yep. Uh, yep. when you've, you and your advisors have had a chance to consider that further, but I may have this totally wrong, so I'm expecting to hear from the staff in reply in quite a lot of detail on this, having presented this memo with three bullet points and not telling us which one yeah, they prefer. Uh, just, but, um, just a minute. So, but my understanding is that for, certainly for a, an aquifer such as the Rangitata Orton, which is allocated, over allocated even under the new method of, of uh, going through the resource consent inventory, there's no option for a T block there because it's over allocated That's even right. under yep, the new yep, method. Yep, yep, yep. All right. So we've just got a couple of questions from the legal subs themselves. And I'm happy for, um, if, if someone else in your team is better to answer the question, then I'm happy yep. for that to occur. So the first one is at para 19. We've obtained a consent in the past to exceed the nitrogen baseline. Just interested, um, what sort of information did you have to provide to enable that consent to be granted? Yeah, so this was in the context of an orange zone property, so we had to provide... Do you want to talk to that? Call? Yeah, so... so if you're right, uh, yes, sorry, so, so when that consent was first granted, it was in conjunction with the purchase of the property and it set out, uh, it was a condition on the purchase of the property and it set out a stocking rate regime into the future. So, and the modelling was done uh, to develop that baseline at that time. And so obviously that's been recalibrated with new versions of Overseer as they've come out since. But it's principally around stocking rates. Okay, so when seeking that consent, you provided um, information on stocking rates, worked out the leaching that would result, and that enabled you to get over the consenting yep. threshold. That's okay. correct, yes. And it was probably easier in your case, Mr Glass, given your um, practice that you told us about in many hearings that you have a lower stocking rate than other farmers because you're a gr primarily grass-based system. Th that's correct, but uh, but the, the Coriston property that this related to, it was certainly grass-based, but principally because it's dairy support, it involves uh, both young stock on pasture, uh, but also uh, cow wintering right. on uh, with uh, intensive winter grazing and the practices with that. If I don't need to ask that anymore. Commissioner Solomon, is there anything that you'd like to ask of Mr That's Williams <laughs> in the team at this stage, or should we go on to Mr Glass? I see that Mr Glass. I don't think, no, I don't think Commissioner Lambeau's house is quite finished with this Sorry, Chair, it's, it's difficult because you, you can't see us, but I, just had, I was just looking at my pages, I just had a couple of more. Okay. That's yes. all right. Sorry about that. Um, Please carry on. Thank you. Just um, 39.2, which is on page 8. And you say their plan change could be amended to do one of two things, either the 39.1 or 39.2. In terms of 39.2, require broader reduction requirements across the sub-region. Would that raise issues of, of scope that would affect other landowners who aren't currently affected? What would be the implications of that? I don't, sorry, I'm looking, reading, just reading through that. 
I think the sub-region referred to there is not intended to be the sub-region as in the Plan Change 7 context. It's right. the part of the region that was formerly a green zone. Apologies, okay. that's ambiguous. Right. Uh, Sydney agreed there would be scope in inflicting nutrient reductions on the wider sub-region yeah. as it's understood. Okay. Couple more. So, um, just the issue you raise at paragraph 43. Now, not a question for you, but just to the officers, um, when you come to do the reply, can you specifically address this issue? And in doing so, refer to Mr. Thomas's evidence regarding the water quality data in the wells that he's presented to us, and in particular his figure seven, which is on page 18 of his evidence. Um, just really have a look at that and come back to us whether or not you agree or disagree and, and what the position is. Come reply regarding that issue of the extent of that um, nitrogen reduction area. Thank you very much. That was, thank you, uh, thank you, David. They were the only questions I had that you couldn't see. I was still rummaging thank through. You. Thanks. Commissioner Sullivan, do you have any questions at this stage? Yes, I just have one for Mr. Glass. I'll just find the paragraph. Oh, well, we'll come to Mr. Glass uh, shortly. Okay. At, the, at this stage, we're looking at the, at, the, at the submission as a whole and, and the legal side of it. And um, we, we will have Mr. Glass have the opportunity to present his evidence and then we can ask his questions on it. Will that be? That's fine. Thank you. Be good? Yeah. So I'll now pass to Mr. Glass. So, so. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, uh, thanks, panel, for the uh, for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, you, you have my evidence, and I'm, I'm happy for you to take that. Um, as, as read, perhaps if I could just uh, uh, perhaps talk to a couple of uh, themes within this evidence, uh, principally around uh, the, I make comment around paragraphs 50 uh, from there on, where it's really talking about nutrient reductions and, uh, and down in, uh, in paragraph uh, 56, where I refer to the, uh, to the, to the impact of nutrient reductions on farmers and how they're now engaged in the processes and with, with the irrigation scheme. So I'm, I'm sure you're going to hear a lot of this over this, uh, this hearing about how engaged the, the farming community, particularly in our case, as members of the Waimakariri Irrigation Scheme, where we've been undertaking farm environment plans and audit processes for a number of years now. We're already very aware of the benefit that that process is bringing on our business, but also on the outcomes that are sought through these processes. I guess the change that I've witnessed over this past decade that that paragraph 56 is, is really referring to is the fact that farmers are now very engaged in seeking you know, solutions and achieving the outcomes sought. Um, that change or that willingness wasn't there certainly 10 years ago, but it's now something that we're seeing quite clear with, with a group of young farmers coming through. And we see a lot of young farming along, a lot of share milkers and contract milking couples in our business that now take this as just what they do. It's part of how we operate today. And you'll see that with the farming submissions that will be presented to this hearing, particularly through our engagement with the, uh, with the Next Generation Farming Group, is that everyone's wanting to do the right thing. The piece here that I really want to bring out is that with the next stage and or phase of the processes that we're now about to embark on, we're talking about achieving what for many of us is, is a leap of faith into the future and, it's, uh, and our responses at any time is really a question of our own confidence and our ability to keep operating. So when you look at the Waimakariri zone at the moment, and the fact that 
the numbers that we will need to farm to in terms of overseer losses into the future, many of us don't quite know what that means. And that's simply because at the moment, we've done our baseline calculations, we've put our farms through the portal, but in many cases we know that those numbers will change and will evolve in the future. And the numbers that have been mentioned, just by way of example, is that through the process, we, we are aware that for many dairy businesses, getting to good management practice compared to the baseline number, now please, this is an academic exercise, it's not reflecting the actual practices necessarily being taken on farm, is that getting to that good management uh, level on baseline is for many dairy farmers a reduction of about 24%, and I think Dairy NZ are talking to this in their evidence uh, later on in the hearing, is that that in itself is a significant change. And then we're talking about then overlaying further reductions on what is, for many farmers, an unknown number. So what I'm sensing is that many people know that change is needed, they want to be part of that process, but it's a massive leap of faith for them and their farm businesses because they honestly don't know today whether they can meet those aspirational targets of the future. But that's not stopping them wanting to be part of the journey. But what the skier is, and you'll see with the group of submissions that's coming forward, is that people are embracing the near-term reductions. They know that that has to happen. They want to be part of that process. But they're really concerned and they're really scared about what further reductions beyond that might mean. And as well as that, they've got a sense that those reductions may not necessarily achieve or make a difference. And that's the bit where they're happy to be part of a process, but at a point, it's a question of remaining true to the journey and the confidence with that, is that if they see that that's not necessarily going to bring about a positive impact somewhere, or potentially it, it has them doing things that simply appear today to be unattainable, they lose their desire to be part of that process. And so what you'll see quite strongly coming through, and, and I've set out in the evidence there from, uh, from effectively paragraph 56 through to uh, paragraph, I think it's 70, 72 to 75, when I'm touching on uncertainty, is that there's a real fear that if we overreach in the short term, we might lose people on the journey to get the long-term gain. And so if there's one thing I can implore you to consider, it would be enabling the communities and farmers to trust the process to get there and put our faith and review processes down, down the journey because what we have already noticed is that for farmers whose farm properties, and this doesn't relate specifically to dairy holdings, but for farmers whose farm properties are in, regarded as being in high risk zones, where they are being asked to make significant reductions, so for some, that's up to 90% reductions below a good management practice baseline that for many of them is not necessarily clear, what many see that is, is that that simply means they're not able to farm. So it's not about whether you change land use. For many, they think it means they're not able to farm at all. Now already, farms, or for people and families that are operating properties that now have that stigma hanging over them, those properties right now, even though we haven't concluded this process, we're far from that, that those properties today are now unsaleable. And those families have a massive stigma with securing finance, with securing contract milkers and share milkers where they're dairy properties, and securing staff, because those farms are seen to be, and I use this phrase loosely, but you'll get the intent of what I'm meaning, 
is that they're dead men walking. And so I implore you, as you're considering the extent of reductions and what that looks like into the future, to be able to be at a level that farmers, the farmers that get that change is required, is to stay true to the journey. But let's not, and please pardon the phrase, stuff it up by overreaching to get something that is a long way away at the moment and then we stop doing the good work that is being done today. My simple belief is, is that if we start taking small steps, is that over time we'll get to maybe the same place, but we'll actually get there faster. What will be worse is to put something out there that everyone feels is utterly unattainable and they lose confidence and they lose the ability to gain finance to employ capable people, and that means that they just simply lose faith in the journey. And so that's, to me, I think that's the challenge that the panel has before you, is that we're all getting the need to make change, but we need to do it in a way that we remain confident and we remain steadfast without losing our nerves. So that's what those paragraphs there in uh, 50 through to, uh, to, to 75 are really referring to, and that's about the community that we're operating within, and I know you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, throughout this hearing. So. <laughs> well, yes, but I don't suppose we'll, we'll hear it explained and, and expressed as clearly as we have just now in your ad lib uh, contribution, Mr. Glass. Thank you for that. It's, it's something that's a little less um, tangible than many of the things that we discuss here but to, to understand it in the way that you've uh, explained it to us today is, of course, valuable to us. Thank you, and look, I, I, I know I'm repeating myself now, but the part that I have seen as this process has played out is that this, as we all know, hasn't just happened overnight. There has been a number of meetings leading up to presentations to the Zonal Committee as the various um, zip uh, addendums have been developed. There's been engagement the whole way through. The piece that I am seeing, and this is not just in this zone, but it's more widely now across the country, but particularly Canterbury, is that farmers are absolutely engaged. Everyone understands now what needs to be done. And now the biggest concern is that they all want to know what the solutions are that they can implore in their businesses right now. The piece that they're worried about is that there won't be a solution for them to do what is being asked. And when we are at that point, that's where my fear is, is that people lose faith in the process. Now, I think we're in a very healthy space out to the reductions that have been sought here just beyond 2030 to go further than that, because of course, we're all thinking about how we can achieve that with today's technology, not the future. And that's the bit that people are simply apprehensive about. And that's happening at the same time when many farmers are being asked to recapitalise their businesses. They've got the uncertainty around COVID-19 that we all talk about these days. But as well as that, within farming communities, we're talking about real needs for farmers to remain steadfast and do the right thing as well. And so farmers are feeling all that pressure. We've all seen that played out publicly over recent, um, over recent months. But the bit that I guess I'm encouraged about is everyone does actually want to do and achieve the same thing here, and that's really powerful. So sorry to go on, but I think it's a very, very important point. Well, we may uh, discuss that further with you shortly, but we also understand that your evidence covers this issue, but also many other issues. And so we don't want to uh, to get it out of proportion either. Um, let, let me see if, if you're agreeable that we take your statement of evidence as read, because we've all read it ourselves anyway. We don't, don't require you to read it to us. But Will it be convenient now if my colleagues and I ask you some questions about what you've put in your evidence and indeed what you've added to it this morning? Yes, sir, absolutely.
Commissioner Solomon. Do you um, have questions you'd yes. like to ask yes. Mr Glass? Yes, thank you. I just have one question. Um, and it's about the Tata farm area. I read your submission and I know you you explained it to my colleague before, earlier about increasing nitrogen loss above GMP. My question is dairying and dairy grazing and cropping the right use for both blocks of land considering you've had to increase the nitrogen loss above GMP. So, so certainly I think we, we need to just understand what GMP means and so for for our business with dairy and dairy support, the main parameters around good management practice that we talk about in developing an overseer number relates to how we measure and manage our water use efficiency and then nitrogen management. Otherwise, all the other things that we do are regarded as being at good management practice. So the main variable you're talking about when we're talking about getting to good management practice principally is talking about water use efficiency. So for the Coriston property in South Canterbury, that property is at good management practice today. There's no irrigation on the farm. And so we've been uh, completing our farm environment plans for a period of time uh, now under our consents and reporting under that. So our belief is, is that that is a use of land that is appropriate for that area. We've been monitoring uh, the other things uh, as conditions under our original consent there with water quality on a monthly basis. That includes sediment and a number of other measures and we have seen no deterioration in any of those over that time. So in terms of the water quality outcomes, we actually do believe that it's a sustainable land use in that area for that reason. In terms, sorry, in terms of the Tata property at Rangitata, uh, so right beside the Rangitata River, that, uh, that property, we've invested very heavily in that over the last uh, 10 years. It's moved all from Rotorain irrigation. It's now fully centre pivot irrigated. We don't bring in, or we bring in minimal supplementary feed, so we are only really using pasture as part of our farm system there. Our nutrient loss has declined over, uh, over time from where it, uh, from where it was. So, so that has been advantageous to us, but we've had the confidence to do that investment because we had the consent around our land use in the first place. So if the farm was reducing its nutrient outputs, why, the, why did you need a consent to increase them? So we sought consent on the Tata property, we sought consent there for for principally for giving us a degree of certainty to invest into the future. Because what we were seeing play out is that good management practices were being overlaid that in theory, and this is initially when they came out, was requiring a water use to go down to levels that we thought were unattainable. We still think some of those water use levels are unattainable and as, you know, unless we've, we've got no room for error with that at all in achieving good management practice. But it's things that we're learning about all the time. So you've got to bit remember, we were doing that before we invested. Now that we've invested and we're on the journey, we're gaining confidence in that, but it's still quite close for us um, in terms of the uh, nutrient levels that we're having to meet each year. So it's a, it's a question around confidence as much as anything. I, I, under, I now understand, thank you. That's all, David. Commissioner Van Doortisen. Yeah, thank you, Mr Glass. No questions from your pre-circulated evidence, but in terms of the um, verbal presentation that you um, spoke to us with paragraph 56 as your starting point, now I'm assuming that um, you're referring to that table 8.9 which is the y in the WIMAC, which has the nitrogen loss reductions going out to 2080. Yes. Yeah. And I assume that, um, and I gather from what you're telling us, and other submitters have said this too, that they can live with 2030, they can live, some of them can live with the 2040 reductions, but it's the 2050 onwards ones that are really 
um, causing the issues of concern and the on-the-ground problems that you've just highlighted to us regarding um, saleability, financing and, and obtaining even staff to work on these properties. Is, it, that, is, is that correct? That's absolutely it. And what, what we've seen, and because obviously with Dairy Holdings and the, the spread of properties, we've got involvement with other uh, zones and particularly other irrigation schemes around Canterbury. I, I'm the chairman of Ashburton Lindhurst Irrigation in mid Canterbury. And, and what we are seeing there is that where we are able to operate within irrigation schemes, that burden and the solutions is, is effectively able to be managed cooperatively. And that's what we've seen there is that that, um, that brings together that community of farmers to be able to achieve those outcomes, but it gives confidence in that process as well. So I think there's, there's a part in my evidence here where it's touching on the importance of Waimakariri irrigation being that conduit to, to achieve that really. And so I think that's the key part uh, that, that can help develop that in these sorts of communities. All right, thank you. So coming back to uh, what you were uh, telling us a few minutes ago, Mr. Glass, we're talking, uh, or I'm asking at the moment, concerning the reductions, say for the, not the, the current decade, which is there, but for the next decade after that. Yes. And you've explained to us these questions of confidence and seeing uh, seeing what's practicable and not being clear about what technical advances might enable the practicality and so forth. And of course there are submitters who are saying look cut all of that out just leave it leave it w with what we've got to do in the current decade and don't tell us what we've got to do in the decade thereafter. But isn't there value for the farmers in their planning and in their managing and in deciding whether to take an interest in technological change or not, to have a focus for what they're going to have to do in the decade after the current one? Doesn't it have to be fairly explained to them that there are major further uh, reductions going to be needed. I, I think this is the challenge around the balance because a lot of this depends on what farmers' time horizons are. And so if, for example, and I, and I, please, I don't have the numbers uh, um, available, but, it, but we might be able to get them, is that you know, if, the, if the average farm, a farmer age in this catchment, as it is around most of New Zealand, if that sits around 55 years of age, then it's important to remember that in the next 10 to 15 years, half of the farm owners will not necessarily be there. And so their focus is only ever going to be for a, for a, you know, a, uh, a 10 to 15 year time horizon. After that, there's another generation coming through that will pick that baton up and they'll be engaged in what those solutions and outcomes are. So I think there's a, there's a healthy balance here, is that is focus on what can be attainable today and what sets the clear direction. But after that, it's about having something that's not too uh, unattainable for people to still reach for. Simply the fact that people know that further change is required is in itself significant. I think the other part though, is that as we get out here, as we're getting beyond 10 years, as we're better tracking our water quality levels and better still knowing where they need to get to, that's the key and most important part that farmers will get. In fact, I guarantee you that as soon as we are better reporting that, that is where we are at today and where we would like those outcomes to get to, farmers will immediately jump to the conclusion whether further work is required and what the magnitude of that is. So simply 
the you know putting faith and confidence around those review and monitoring processes for me I think is the bit that you'll see farmers absolutely engaged because that's the way we're wired is that we're always looking to how we solve stuff because that's what farm that's what farmers do <laughs> they don't want to necessarily know all the other stuff they just in many cases we're getting phone calls all the time where farmers are simply saying oh look this is all confusing can you just tell me what I've got to do and I think that's the challenge and if it can come back to what the water quality outcome is that we're seeking to achieve where we're at today and then the job that's still to be done that in itself will absolutely empower them they'll get it thank you for your answer Mr. Glass. thank you and thank you also for the evidence that you've prepared in which we haven't really gone through uh, all of it in detail because we don't need to it's uh, clearly expressed and we understand it thank you now we have we have mr thomas as yep, well mr. thomas is yep. here so neil he's obviously produced a relatively short brief to start with so um i don't know if there's anything you need to talk to neil so. Uh, I'm I'm happy to take questions if yes thank thank you Mr Thomas thank you for presenting your uh, statement and been a lot of work in preparing it but thank you okay. uh, Commissioner Van Borten any questions of Mr Thomas no Mr Thomas in terms of the um the evidence and the issues you raised, you're aware I've already asked the officers to look into that for us because I thought you'd, you'd laid them out clearly, so I don't need to ask you anything by way of clarification. But I did um, let you know that I'd be interested to know if you've had a chance to look at that 23rd September uh, memo that I was discussing with Council. Are you? Uh, I have seen the memo, yes, yep. yep. Um, and did you consider then the three bullet points that were the possible solutions posed in that memo and give them any thought or did you uh, not do that at the time? Um, that this in respect to the groundwater allocation options. Yeah. Um, yes, to some extent. Um, there's evidence I've prepared for Fonterra, which is discussed later in the hearing process, um, which probably goes through the allocation in a bit more detail. Okay. Um, and I might be in a better position to sure. answer your questions at that stage. If OK, that'd be good. So if you could maybe at that t between now and then refresh your mind on that memo and think about which of those three bullet points from a technical perspective you prefer and the reasons why. Yeah. That would be helpful. Yep. Yeah, thank you. But no, no questions from your evidence. It was very clear. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Solomon, any questions for Mr Thomas? Um, just one. It's just really a point of clarification. In your paragraph 15 of your evidence and I don't know whether you can answer this because you didn't put this list together. I'm looking at 15.1 yes. How do they know that the nitrate leaching is high if it hasn't been measured? My understanding is, is that they've used Overseer to model areas where um, nitrate leaching is higher or lower Thank you. That was all from me. Well, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, I've no questions for you, and we're grateful to you for preparing your evidence and coming today to uh, present it. Thank you very much. And in terms of DHL case, I haven't got anything further to say at this point but you'll obviously hear from me several times over in the coming weeks so thank you well of course that that will be something for us to look forward to <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> so as far as the dhl case is concerned that that's the end of it yep. for now and uh, we're grateful of course for you all of you for coming and uh, presenting it to us Thank you. Thank so. you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>
Now, speaking to the uh, hearing manager, Ms. Fernando, where, where are we at on, on the program now? Um, that's, uh, that's it for this morning, for the morning session. Um, Mr. Fraser um, is not here. All right. And this afternoon we have uh, Avon Otakaro. Yes, that's correct. Carlton Dairies. Yes. And Dairy NZ. Yes, that's correct. So, uh, what time do we start again? At 2 p.m. At 2 p.m. Yes. Splendid. All right, well, we'll adjourn now till 2 p.m. Great, thank you.